the question is why has our society become so uh, weak-willed in many respects? It, it accepts all kinds of untrue, obvious untruths and acts as if they were true. Uh, and that is a much worse uh, threat than anything from outside. So that, for example, just the way we think about social problems is often completely wrong. We, we treat the people as if they were objects rather than subjects, as if they're not reacting to their own circumstances, in fact, and we give them bad incentives and so on and so forth. Um, so the, the, I think the intellectual dishonesty of the West is the greatest uh, threat to our societies. Uh, we, we can't say what we really think. Uh, we, we can only say what we don't think, uh, many of us. And, um, and that is, is really um, the greatest threat. And the only solution to that is for people to speak up and to write, which is what I've done. Not with any great effect, I must say. But <laughs> that's all I can do anyway. Say more about the theme that you build in your books about um, the wrong-headedness of determinism. What yeah. is it for people that are listening? And say more. We live uh, the intellectually dominant um, model, if you like, is of people who are determined, who are uh, forced to behave in the way they do by their circumstances, by their psychology and so on and so forth, and they can't behave in any other way. Um, now the people who put forward that view never think of themselves in the same light, and in fact it's absolutely impossible for anyone to believe himself to be determined in the way that he says that millions of other people are determined. Um, and so no one, and no one is so determinist that he fails to blame his parents, for example. So, um, um, uh, but if you regard uh, determinism as uh, true, uh, then of course you you are taking away uh, in your mind people's ability to um, to behave other than they do, and it's up to you to force them to behave. Uh, differently, and th this is extremely unrealistic, in fact, because people, however, however um, poor, however poorly educated they are, they do make their decisions. That's what being a human being is. So actually, determinism dehumanizes quite a large sector of the population. Uh, I'll give you an example of the uh, uh, the kind of thing I used to say in the prison. Um, uh, I used to ask heroin addicts, and there were quite a long number in the prison, they, they, I used to say, ask them why they started taking heroin. And they said as if uh, they, they were affected by some kind of gravity, I fell in with the wrong crowd. That was their explanation. I fell in with the wrong crowd. And I used to say, well, it, it's funny. Um, I uh, meet many people who fell in with the wrong crowd, but I never meet any member of the wrong crowd itself. And they would start laughing because they knew that their own explanation was wrong, that they had actually uh, found the wrong crowd. They were attracted by the wrong crowd and they were attracted by the wrong, what the wrong crowd did. And therefore, that explanation that it was just a kind of social gravity was actually false. And they know it's false, but they derive certain advantages from presenting it as if it were true because there are lots of people who are who are talking to them as if it might be true. So as a professional, when you're dealing with these people, are you working to try to get them to own their responsibility? Mm. And the, the free will is the other side of determinism, correct? Well, that, that, that is correct. But also, it's very important because if, um, to get it right, because you're not saying, well, it's just your fault and therefore I don't sympathize with you at all and uh, go away, don't darken my door again, um, I will have nothing to do with you. The sentimental view is that you cannot sympathize with people unless uh, they are innocent. Uh, but in fact, they're, they're guilty of something, but we're all guilty of something and we all need that kind of understanding a lot of the time. But the sentimental view is either you are innocent and just a victim or 
you are a perpetrator or alternatively you are a saviour of people who are victims. But that's not realistic and it, it's actually false. Okay, based on your experiences in the prisons and elsewhere, uh, explain ISIS and the barbarism and the tactics we're seeing from the jihadists and what makes British and American students go sign up and join these people? Uh, one of the things that I think that, uh, that is um, awful, uh, uh, I mean there are many things that are awful about ISIS, but I think the people who, who are, for example, beheading others and so on, are enjoying what they're doing. That is a very frightening uh, uh, thing. With regard to um, why French, British, Belgian, American children uh, join up. I think that it's probably a search for meaning and significance in a world in which they don't feel there is much meaning and significance and obviously uh, Islamism is a kind of um, uh, ideology which claims to explain everything and to will set everything right. Youth is rather uh, attracted to that kind of thing there are a group of people who are who love violence anyway, um, so I think it, it all comes together. And, one, and it might even be a consequence of the downfall of communism, which at, at one time these people probably would have been, or many of them, would have been communists. Uh, but with the downfall of communism, um, or Marxists anyway, um, uh, and as we now see, the Marxist guerrillas were not as bad as the uh, as ISIS. Well, unfortunately, it is a fact of uh, human uh, psychology that there are quite a large number of people who enjoy cruelty. I mean, and and there's an enormous fund of cruelty in in uh, modern life, which is often hidden. But in the work in which I did in the hospital, I was absolutely horrified. I, I it, came as a bit of revelation to me how cruel, uh, how much cruelty was going on in ordinary life. So that uh, I saw hundreds of women who had been strangled or beaten or had their hair pulled, suspended out of uh, 11th floor windows by their feet. Uh, astonishing things that I, I hadn't realized uh, could be uh, could be done or would be done, and this, of course, was not state mandated. It wasn't the state doing this. This was individuals. So there are large numbers of people, I'm afraid, who inf enjoy inflicting misery on others. And when you unite that kind of sadism to a sense of pur uh, uh, kind of messianic purpose then obviously it's a very unpleasant combination. Um, so, um, uh, in a way, I'm not all that surprised by it. I, I, I mean, after having, I must say, after having worked uh, and seen people do the kind of things I have seen them do, I, I, I don't find anything terribly surprising, I'm afraid. And I, perhaps one shouldn't find it all that surprising in view of human history. But in terms of politics or diplomacy or sociology, what can a people or a society do to deal with this phenomenon? Is, is there something we can do to bolster our immune system? Are there institutions that aren't working? Are there ways to talk to these people to get them to not go this way? Well, I think there are social conditions which either encourage or discourage it. You will never eliminate this kind of behavior altogether. There is nothing new under the sun where, where human behavior is concerned. You can always find a precedent for it somewhere. So you can either make it more prevalent or less prevalent. You can't eliminate it. And um, uh, if I take my own society, I think we've done everything possible to encourage it. 
if you take, for example, violence between men and women, and I used to see about, in my one ward, six-bed ward, I used to see about 400 women a year who had been uh, abused by men, and often quite severely. I mean, I'm not talking about, as they said, just a slap. Uh, I, I'm talking about quite severe abuse. And I saw 400 men who had abused women, and I also saw 200 women who had abused men, because violence of women towards men has increased, if anything, faster. Um, but anyway, I was thinking about the prevalence of this and why it should have become so prevalent. And one of the reasons is, I'm afraid, the breakdown of any, f any, um, any system of relations between the sexes. So, viol uh, so jealousy has increased enormously. Um, and the reason jealousy has increased so enormously is because there is no structure to the relations between men and women. There's no formality, there's no contract, there's no sense of obligation, and so on and so forth. And this, I think, probably comes from the 1960s feeling that human relations should be determined just by the uh, emotions of the moment. So if, for example, I'm married to you or I'm living with you and we have a quarrel, well then we just split up. That's what, you know, we just uh, split up. And that leads to uh, enormous jealousy because the man is never sure of the... He wants both the exclusive sexual possession of someone but he also wants his sexual freedom. And these two things don't go very well together. If you, if you put those two things together, what you get is a man who is inclined to be extremely jealous towards his girlfriend, and, and that is a very powerful um, uh, promoter of violence between people. And if, in addition, uh, the possession of a woman is almost the only uh, uh, way in which a man gets any kind of self-respect, particularly in the lower part of society, where, where respectable work has uh, disappeared, then this is a, a recipe for disaster. Uh, at one time, men at the lower end of, of society would derive a, at least a pride in, in the work that they did in being able to provide for their family. That gave them a self-respect. But in many parts of the country, at least in Britain, that's no longer possible. Uh, yes. Both because the work itself has disappeared, but also because they are um, more and more humiliated by the lower the, the, the position that they find themselves in society, largely because of communications. They, they see other people much more living well. So, so that we've done everything possible to, to um, first to break up family, and then I don't think we've done it deliberately, but we've created conditions in which lots of people don't have much self-respect by any other means. So the rise of the welfare state would be an accelerator for what you're talking about? It would about. be, it would, yes. Uh, the welfare state uh, makes a lot of this possible, but doesn't make it inevitable, because there are welfare states in which it, it, it is less so, like, for example, in Scandinavia. Um, so I, I would say the welfare state makes it it's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. What are the symptoms of a society or a country who is in decline from your point of view? Well, I thought about it uh, in relation to my own country, which is Britain, and that and. Um, I think one sign, particularly in Britain, is that the simplest problems become uh, unsolvable. So that, for example, in my, the little town in which I live, which is a very nice little town, a uh, very beautiful little town, um, there's terrible drunkenness at night, or that it's actually declined because the people have gone spontaneously, they've gone somewhere else. But everywhere in Britain you see tremendous drunkenness, associated violence, but also things like people vomiting in the street and, and, and uh, very unpleasant uh, scenes. Um, 
and the, the city councils or the town councils simply don't do anything about it. And if you try to get them to do something about it, you can't get them to do something about it. So here is a very, very simple, but you can't get a simpler problem than that for a council to deal with, and yet it can't do it, or won't do it. Well, I'm afraid in the Western world there is a tendency for, um, uh, for uh, politics, I, I mean day-to-day -day politics, to seem to make very little difference. We, we are on a, it's like being on a tanker which is steaming or going towards, uh, maybe going towards the rocks or go, anyway, going in one direction. And it's very difficult to change direction even if you change the party that is ruling. In some ways that's, well, it's not too bad because you don't want terrible, I mean, at least I don't want terrible uh, veerings in the country from one extreme policy to another extreme policy and back again and so on. Um, but as I, I mentioned before, I, my experience of trying to change little things in the town in which I live has made me realize in a way that I hadn't really realized before how difficult it is to effect real changes uh, in, a, in a society. And the only thing, I think ultimately what determines the direction of the society is the culture of the society more than the politicians. And the politicians, I'm afraid, well, obviously they're out for office. They make the kind of compromises that, they, uh, that are necessary to achieve office. And given the nature of the political contest in which people devote their entire lives to seeking office, and office is often the whole meaning of their lives. I mean, I, I would, I, a prime example of that is Mrs. Clinton. I, I should imagine without seeking office, she doesn't even exist to herself. It is the meaning of her existence, seeking office. And I think this is so of more and more politicians as politics has become professionalized so that more and more politicians have never done anything in their lives except politics. They've started at the age of 16 or 18 at college and they've gone on. Um, so the, the most important thing is to try and uh, change the culture of the society because they will eventually, re they will respond to that simply by the nature of their own ambitions. Um, uh, so I think in the long term that's the only, that is the only solution. I I, uh, to hope for the man on the white horse to come and to change things I don't think is realistic. Are there any other things that come to mind? Yes, well, you've mentioned uh, graffiti as a possible sign of um, uh, degeneration. However, I must say I, I think I found a, an interesting fact about, or, or I've observed a tendency in, in, in graffiti, and that is that it is actually an aesthetic judgment or an aesthetic judgment passed on the towns and cities in which people live. Because in general, at least in Britain and France, uh, people who write graffiti or whatever you want to call paint it or whatever you want to call it, uh, tagging, um, they don't deface good buildings. They only deface ugly buildings and in particular bad, hideous surfaces of which unfortunately uh, modernity has provided them with a lot. And, um, and this is not because they can't reach good buildings, because they, they actually take a pride in reaching places which are very difficult to get to and even dangerous to get to. So while they may not realize that they're actually uh, somewhat inchoately uh, doing it, they are passing an aesthetic judgment, uh, which I think is uh, very interesting. Um, there are many other things that we've seen, like family breakdown. In Britain, 52% of children are born uh, illegitimate or in, in many countries. Now, you can't even use that word. In the hospital in which I worked, with the exception of people of Indian origin, in, um, the uh, illegitimacy rate was virtually 100%. And it became an indelicate question to ask a 16-year-old who his father was. And sometimes they would 
answer by saying things like, um, well, do you mean my father at the moment? Um, and so they actually grow up in, a, in an almost fatherless environment, uh, and serial stepfatherhood is the, the fam family model, of, or household model, I should say, you can't really call it a family model, a household model. And it seems to me that this is self-evidently disastrous, both for individuals and for society. Not in every case, because of course people can survive almost anything, but um, socially it's, it, it's a disaster. What are your observations about a nation that de-Christianizes itself? Well, I, I, uh, with regard to religion, I can't claim to be religious myself, but unlike many people who are not religious, I'm not anti-religious, provided, of course, that we're not talking about a theocracy. But I don't think there's any danger of theocracy in America or indeed anywhere else, uh, except, of course, in the Muslim world, where there's a very real danger of theocracy. Um, uh, so, uh, the question is how you can maintain, I, I mean, I think religion has very good social um, consequences, uh, but it's very difficult uh, to promote uh, religion if you're not religious yourself. I mean, the, the religion is only valuable if people actually believe its tenets, its doctrines or, or, or that on which it is. Base. So I'm not sure how you can go about um, uh, making people more religious. I'm not, I don't know about that. As to um, uh, as to what the effects are, well, certainly um, in Britain and, and probably it will be in the United States, the effects are very very harmful. On the other hand, there are other societies where it's less harmful where it's been less harmful. I would say France is an example where it's slightly less harmful than in Britain and probably Scandinavia. Scandinavia um, has de-Christianized itself, although there are state churches in, uh, de jure state churches in, um, in uh, Scandinavia, but they're not de facto. Give us an, an, an anecdote of a particularly memorable prisoner. One uh, prisoner who I thought was uh, very interesting from a kind of social point of view was a prisoner whose main ambition in life was to be the most dangerous and difficult prisoner in the entire uh, prison system. And actually that was quite interesting because he was very ambitious. He was quite an intelligent man, but not intelligent or gifted enough to pursue a really worthwhile goal. So he made himself extremely difficult. He made himself very fit, very violent, aggressive. He had to be moved from prison to prison because uh, two weeks of him was enough for any uh, prison. He became actually notorious, famous and notorious. He was a bank robber. And he wrote books which sold extremely well about how to keep fit in prison. Um, and. He was interesting because I think there are many people like that who are, who are of, uh, they're above average intelligence, uh, they have some ability, but they are unwilling to accept a normal existence because they, their demand for celebrity, fame, celebrity, is so great. And so they will pursue any end in order to achieve that celebrity, however bad that end. And actually you see this with, I think, uh, with that pilot who crashed the German plane into the Alps, Andreas Lubitz. I think he was of the same kind. He didn't want to go quietly. He wanted to, to ha even at the cost of his own death, he, he wanted to make a... a, a a big impact, and and this was a prisoner like that. I mean, I saw many other uh, very remarkable prisoners, um, serial, the odd serial killer, and so on. Um, um, but he uh, he sticks out in my mind as being of significance for for the culture as a whole. From your perspective within the NHS, what is a what is America in store for if it doesn't repeal Obamacare? Well. Um, uh, the NHS 
is not quite as bad as people say. I mean, it, the fact is that uh, you know, people's life expectancies increase, they get treatment and so on. It's very unreliable and it, it is, hum for many people, it's a humiliating experience. But many people have good experiences of the National Health Service. Um, the real problem with the National Health Service, but it's also, uh, it is a problem with all third party payers, is that you get what somebody else decides you get and the doctor becomes a functionary of the state. And uh, in Britain, it's certainly in my life, there was a time, for example, when the government more or less left doctors alone. I mean, you, you got money. In fact, you got a lot less money than you get now, but you were independent. The government, the, the government did actually leave you alone. Now the government uh, determines almost everything and quite a lot of what you, in fact probably the majority of what many doctors do is what is mandated by somebody else. That is a, that's a, a problem, it's not just in the National Health Service, that is an international tendency I'm afraid and I think the insurance companies can do exactly the same. At least with insurance companies there's a kind of market to to um, some kind of competition. In the National Health Service, of course, there is no competition. I was thrilled to be retired. Um, I was pleased to be retired because I'm rather impatient of uh, bureaucracy. And it was obviously increasing very rapidly. And uh, I used to be able to say in the prison, uh, for example, uh, if I believed that I had, you know, I had a way of treating someone, someone might say to me, but that's not government policy. And I would say, well, I don't care what government policy is. I'm the doctor around here and I make the decision. And if it goes wrong, I'm to blame. And if it's good, well, so much better. Um, but that, that's becoming more and more difficult and you're becoming circumscribed and you're actually... Uh, monitored to see whether you're doing, you're being a good boy and uh, uh, and doing what is right uh, according to somebody else's uh, ideas. From your life experience, what do you think the road to hell is paved with? <laughs> there are many different varieties of hell. Um, uh, I don't, I don't think good intentions quite, uh, uh, quite captures it. I think it's um, uh, bad intentions masquerading as good intentions, which are, which are more dangerous than good intentions. So people f claim to be having good intentions when actually their real motives are very different. And, and are, they could see what their real motives were if they underwent true self-examination, but they don't. So the drive for power, for example, is obviously um, a, a powerful a paving stone to hell. Especially in Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. <laughs>